Thank you. Sure. I guess you can't get rid of that thing you can talk. Just just ignore it. It's uh it's wonderful to be back here. I've been back for a day and it's just terrific interacting with students and faculty in a place that nurtured me for 40 years in a, uh, a wonderful career that, that we've had here. Uh, so the talk today is Heat and Fluids in the Earth's Crust on the back of the envelope. It's a talk that I put together for a meeting in June in Potsdam, Germany. But I found in Potsdam that the Germans don't do things on the back of the envelope. They do them on a coaster for beer. So they said, you need to put a subtitle here for often beer decal. So here's some beer decal. So, so uh, it's a, in a way, the talk is the highlights of thermal geophysics over the past few decades. Some old stuff, some new stuff. Uh, but we'll start with my field area. And my field area is this uh, right here. That's my field area. And since 70% uh, of it in, is oceanic, uh, we'll start in the oceans. So one of the, the first major triumphs of thermal geophysics is in providing an explanation for some of the phenomena that go along with seafloor spreading. So here, the, the cartoons at the top show you what's physically going on with seafloor spreading. So this is a, a map of temperature versus depth at a mid-ocean ridge, and then as the plate moves away from the mid-ocean ridge. So at the ridge, we have uh, temperatures that are essentially isothermal or adiabatic, where material is coming up from the mantle right up to the surface of the ridge. Up, up to the surface of the ridge. And then once the material hits the seafloor and, and, and the bottom water temperature establishes, I'm, I'm sorry. I have a new computer because my computer uh, didn't work. I couldn't sign on to the University of Utah Wi-Fi, so bear with me. <coughs> so the, the Temperature after at the mid-ocean ridge. I'm sorry. Somehow when I move the cursor, it advances the slide. Anyway, so once it hits the, the mid-ocean ridge, then after that, the as the material is pulled away from the mid-ocean ridge, then it cools. Maybe I'm just going to have to. <laughs> so T1, T2, T3, and T4 show the cooling of the oceanic plate as it moves away from the mid-ocean ridge. So this has three consequences in terms of observables. Number one, the thermal gradient at the surface decreases monotonically with time or with distance from the ridge. Secondly, the difference between any set of isotherm, geotherms for say T1 and T2 uh, constitutes a cooling of the material. So the material contracts. And if you put that together with loading from ocean water, you get the depth of the seafloor as it moves away. So it predicts the topography of the seafloor. And then finally, the temperature at which any one of these geotherms hits the temperature of the, the uh, the adiabat would map the, the lithosphere. This is the cool lithosphere. And so you get three predictions. You get heat flow versus age. You get the depth of the seafloor versus age over here. And you get the base of the lithosphere or LAB, lithosphere, cenosphere, boundary versus age. So these three things, and uh, I want to explore the mathematics. So. So the top, uh, top right, I'll just give you directions in, in words. So the top right is the one-dimensional time-dependent heat conduction equation without any sources. That uh, is the way to set up this problem. It's called Kelvin's problem because Lord Kelvin in the late 1890s said, 
if these temperature gradients result after cooling of the earth, then I can tell the age of the earth from the geotherm of the earth's surface. And Lord Kelvin calculated the, the age of the earth from this cooling. The nice solution to this is the simple solution in terms of, of the error function. Okay. <clears throat> I'll just explain in words where we're to go on this slide. This is really annoying. <clears throat> so the, the, this is the, the solution. And uh, the bottom left cartoon shows you what the error function looks like. It's a beautiful little function. And it's equal to, does anyone know how I can disable? So when I hit the trackpad, it advances the slide. So I, Would you like uh, a laser pointer so you can at least point? Well, except the, the laser pointer does okay for here, but not for the Zoom people. It's probably better than going back and forth. Okay, do you have a laser pointer? Thank you. So the, the, the graph down here is the, the error function. It's a beautiful little function. The property is that the error function of zero are zero. The error function of a large of a small number is equal to the small number, so it's linear at the origin, and the error function of a large number is equal to one. So a nice function. It looks like these geotherms if you tilt it on the end. So the question is, what is a small number and what is a large number? Well, the error function uh, now I have to learn how to use this. <laughs> What's the? You're shooting your hand. Yeah. Pardon? You are shooting you. Am I off? <laughs> <laughs> Is this? So this okay. is better. This one. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So it turns out the error function of one is 0.866 and the error function of two is 0.998. So everything happens in the error function between really zero and one. So we go back to the argument of the error function up here. Then when Z is equal to root four times the diffusivity times the time, then this argument is equal to one. So when does that happen in the earth? So for uh, T is equal to 1 million years in this thermal diffusivity. This is equal to 1 when Z is about 10 kilometers. In 100 million years, it happens when Z is equal to 100 kilometers, roughly 100 kilometers. So everything that happens in the age of the seafloor happens between 0 million years and about 100 million years. So that's the age of the, the seafloor that we have. Now you can take this function this error function, and you can take the derivative and get the thermal gradient multiplied by conductivity, and it predicts the heat flow. So the heat flow in oceanic lithosphere is equal, when you collect all the, the constants together, is just equal to 500 over the square root of age in milliwatts per square meter. So at 1 million years old, heat flow is 500 milliwatts per square meter. At 100 million years ago, it's 50 milliwatts per square meter. So that's the cooling of the ocean lithosphere from zero to old age. The bathymetry is likewise a similar thing, which is equal to 2.7 plus one third square root of age. So at t equal to zero, depth is 2.7 kilometers. That's the depth of a mid ocean ridge on average. And at 100 million, well, let's take 81 million years because that makes the square root easy. So 81 root is nine divided by three, three plus 2.7 is 5.7. That's the abyssal plane. So we've gone from 2.7 kilometers down to the abyssal plane. And finally, the listed sphere is even easier, 11 square root of age. <clears throat> so at, at 1 million years, it's basically 11 kilometers. That's a little more than the oceanic crust of the mid ocean ridge. And 100 million years, it's equal to 110 kilometers. So I've often maintained that 
thermal geophysicist should make a flag with these three equations on it. And we should parade around and say, this is our gift to the world. The heat flow, the bathymetry, and the lithospheric thickness on the back of an envelope in these pithy three little equations. Right? This is our gift to the world, or maybe to geology and geophysics, or, or maybe just to thermal geophysics. <laughs> So, but before we make the, the, the flags, we should say, how well does this fit with observations? So I'm gonna take you through observations in reverse order, lithosphere, bathymetry, and heat flow. So here's the, the test of lithosphere, sinosphere boundary versus the age of the seafloor. Remember zero, we don't have seafloor much older than about 160 million years. So this is a common diagram we're going to use, a common axis. So the prediction is the dashed line and the data largely from surface wave dispersion is here. And except for old ocean basins, this is about as good as it gets in seismology. Right, any seismology friends here? <laughs> so it's pretty good. Uh, there's two few, few data, some are receiver functions, and there's one magneto to lurk determination here. So that fits pretty well. Bathymetry is even better. So here's bathymetry in kilometers. There's three kilometers at the ridge. There's abyssal plains out here. The dots are the average bathymetry in ocean floor binned in two million year segments. So it's a beautiful fit. The gray area is plus or minus one standard deviation. So it's a noisy data set, but the average is a beautiful fit. In fact, it covers up, it covers up the, it covers up the prediction. So that's pretty good. So then finally we go to, to heat flow and heat flow is quite good for older seafloor. So these, these are the measurements binned into 2 million year segments. But at about 50 million years, this heat flow is much less than the expected heat flow. So you could say, well, the prediction fails, but in fact, it doesn't fail because bathymetry is so good. And bathymetry is a measure of the integrated temperature down to the base of the lithosphere, whereas heat flow is a skin measurement in three to five meters within the sea floor. So uh, there's a couple of things to be said about this slide. The first is a quote that, that Turi Serling used. I think it's a quote from Carl Tarikian at Yale University. And it is, if you don't get what you're looking for, perhaps something more interesting is going on. <laughs> So let me repeat that, especially for graduate students. If you don't get what you or your thesis advisor are looking for, then maybe something more interesting is, is going on. And the second is an anecdote about the first paper I ever gave at a, an international meeting. It was the IUGG, International Union of Geodesy and Geophysics, meeting in Grenoble, France in 1975. I was still a graduate student, I just published a paper on global heat flow where I noticed as a graduate student, the maps of global heat flow were really distorted because it was a very sparse data set. So for example, if you had high heat flow in the Red Sea and no heat flow in the Precambrian of Egypt, the functions went ballooned over all of Egypt. And so you predicted very high heat flow in Precambrian, which wasn't realistic. At that time, there were two papers that came out. One was by a set of Russians, Polyak and Shmirnov, which predicted or showed that heat flow on the continents was related to the last tectonothermal event. And measurements in the oceans were emerging that said heat flow was related to the age of the oceans. So maps at the University of Michigan on the tectonics of the continents were available. Maps had just come out on the age of the sea floor from Pittman and Talwani at Lamont University. So I spent a month 
going over these maps. And for every five degree by five degree element, I calculated what the heat flow should be according to these predictors. And I drew up a new global heat flow map based on a, a full data set, albeit uh, artificially uh, presented or, or augmented. I was very happy with it. And the paper got about 300 reprint requests very quickly, which is amazing, maybe because it was printed in color and people wanted a global heat flow map in color. So I was very happy. It might have gotten me my job at the University of Utah in 1975-76. So I gave this paper and I was very happy with it. But at the end of my paper, a stocky Englishman with an English accent walked up and said, nice paper, Chapman. Too bad you're wrong and walked away. <laughs> and I said to myself, who is this asshole? <laughs> As I found out later, it was Clive Lister from the University of Washington, whom I later realized was a genius asshole. <laughs> and so what I want to show you is what happened from Clive Lister's suggestion. Clive was working on the Juan de Fuca Ridge and with a graduate student, Earl Davis. And what he was finding out is that the reason for these low heat flow values was that he thought that the water was circulating into the crust, mining the heat, coming out where you couldn't measure it on topographic highs. And, and therefore the difference between the measured heat flow and the predicted heat flow was a measure of how much water was going into the crust and coming out and mining this heat. Well, how much, at the top of the slide, you can't see, but it says how much water so I thought right away, let's do a calorimetry experiment. So here's the graph that you saw earlier. So there's predicted heat flow and here's observed heat flow. So this shaded area is the heat that's mined by water circulating through the crust. The units are watts per square meter, but if you multiply it by time to get the area, then you get joules per square meter, which is an amount of heat. And so I suppose that you put water into the crust at one temperature, you bring it out of the crust at another temperature. So I asked, what's the column, what's the height of a column of water that's necessary to provide this, uh, that the heat that you've mined? So there's the, the way we formulate it, uh, all falls out. There's the height of the column. Won't bear you, bore you with, with all of the numbers, but this is the deficit. Uh, we have to, this is 50 million years. This is the time. Uh, we have to convert years into seconds. And what we get is 10 to the 13 joules per square meter of heat that would cause this deficit. And when you ask what's the height of a column of water, you get 200 kilometers, 200 kilometers. The average ocean depth is four kilometers. So that's 50 ocean depths are going through the crust in 50 million years. So all the water on the top of a piece of crust goes through its part of its crust every million years. So John Bowman tells me that's the biggest water rock interaction on, on the Earth, so with all due respect to Alta, Stock, and other places like that. So a, a lot of water. So here's what we think is happening. This is a little uh, cartoon that, that Clive Lister actually put together, but it's been expanded by Rob Harris and myself. So it depends on the basement. I think I pooped out the, yeah, uh, it doesn't matter. It depends on, on the basement and the sediment cover. So on the left, you have water, you have the basement that no, has no sediment on it. And so water goes in and out and so forth. We can't measure that because to measure oceanic heat flow, you need to put a probe into the seafloor and you can only put that into sediments. So we don't really have good measures of that. Then when we have sediment, oh, I've got it back. So here's a little bit of sediment, but where you have sea mounts, it, the, the hot water is coming out here and you can't see it. But as you get more and more sediment, then you can make measurements all through here. 
Now, the reason that we didn't understand this in the early 70s, but we understood it later, had to do with technological advances in making heat flow measurements. So in the early days, you made measurements by dropping a probe into the, into the seafloor here, but the average, the wavelength or the characteristic dimension here is a few kilometers. So to really understand it well, what you need is many measurements per kilometer. So measurements spacing the 200, 300 meters and so forth. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, I want to show you uh, what's happening here. So on the ocean ridge, so this is the water getting into the crust and coming out of the crust at the mid-ocean ridge. You're familiar, I hope, with, with black smokers and white smokers. So this, this slide comes from a presentation in 1979. So it's four years, thank you, this one. So it's four years after the French IUG meeting and Dick Holland from Harvard University had a grainy uh, videotape in which they'd been down on the mid ocean ridges and taken pictures, the first pictures of the smokers. And I remember being in the audience in a big auditorium when he was showing this and, and talking about it. It was just amazing. People had never seen this before. And then the tube worms and the crabs and everything else. So it was quite amazing. My question wasn't on the biology, but was uh, what, what thermal power is being, uh, is being emitted by, by a black smoker? And it's an easy calculation. Uh, it's just the heat is equal to mass times, thank you, Paul, mass times specific heat times delta T. Power is energy over time. So what you needed is the mass flow, specific heat and delta T. And in the submersible, they measured delta T of 350 degrees C. The velocity from the video of particles coming out was three meters per second, and they measured the dimension. If you put all that together, it turns out that a black smoker is emitting power at 130 megawatts. That's a small power plant. The Roosevelt Milford power plant is a Blundell power plant is 30 megawatts. So it's, it's bigger than small power plants. It's not as big as big power plants, but it's substantial. One of the follow-ons in that is if you extract this much heat, you cool off that section of the crust very quickly. So you predict that smokers would only last for about 10 years. And in fact, when they go back to the mid-ocean ridge where they film smokers, they're dead after 10 years and so forth. So that all fits together. Okay, now for the, the technology. So now I want to move from this environment to this environment where we make measurements. So I, I, I mentioned just a, a moment ago that uh, there was a problem in having measurements too far spaced apart. And the reason for that is that starting in the 50s, when people started making heat flow measurements in the oceans, this was the probe they used. It's called a Bullard probe after Teddy Bullard at Cambridge University. So you need a temperature gradient, which you get by putting thermistors all the way down a probe. And then you drop this probe free fall into the sediment at the bottom of the ocean. Now the problem is there's a, an incompatible design characteristic for this because you want to have the probe as large as possible so you have a strong tube that doesn't bend when it's going in or doesn't bend when it's being pulled out if the cable is stretched to one side or the other. <clears throat> but the time constant of the probe is proportional to the radius squared so you want a small probe to have a short time constant. So the incompatibility is wanting both a thick probe and a small probe at the same time. So the consequences is that this Bullard probe took more than an hour to make the measurement. The tube was often bent at pullout. It came out sort of like a pretzel. 
So often they have to recover it to the ship to check that it wasn't bent. Because if you put a bent probe, try to insert it again, it wouldn't just wouldn't go in. And the time to winch the probe up and down through three meters of water was two hours plus. So at most you could get measurements, maybe one a day or two a day. And since you didn't want to waste your time on measurements in the same place, you move the ship a few kilometers or 10 kilometers. So our observations were based on measurements 10 kilometers apart, and we wouldn't see the thermal consequences of the water circulating in and out of the crust at short wavelengths. <clears throat> so we enter the genius asshole. So this is Clive Lister. So three things happened in the mid 70s. So let me remind you, micro, the, the first Intel chip was 1974. So we can now have microcomputers that could store huge amounts of data. GPS positioning came into play in the late 78s and then for public consumption in the early 80s. So you now knew where the ship was within meters and not just within hundreds of meters or kilometers. And then Clive Lister invented the heat flow probe, which we call his violin probe. Clive was a cellist. So he knew that if you have a violin bow or a cello bow, you have the sensitive element, which is the string, but you have a strength element, which is the stick. So Clive said, why do we go for this single probe why don't we make a probe where we have a strength element? And this happened to be two and a half inch drill string that would never bend on insertion or pull out. And let's put the sensitive elements in a thin stainless steel tube probe just far enough away from the strength member that you didn't see the heat pulse in the time that you wanted to make the measurement. Brilliant. Why didn't I think of it? Right? Brilliant. So what we get is, a bunch of thermistors in this short tube for fast response, microcomputers. And then once you did that, <clears throat> you could send it and, and you could store data for more than a day. You could send it overboard in the morning, put it down, and you knew it wasn't going to be bent. So you left it in for 15 or 20 minutes, made the measurement. You pulled it out, advanced 100 meters or 200 meters, put it in again advanced another 100 meters, put it in again. So you operate in what we call pogo mode. So pogo stick of going down like this. So you turned out you could make 15 to 20 measurements in a ship. Here's what the measurements look like. It's just absolutely beautiful. So here's, here's the data stream that comes back to you. It's temperature versus time. So time is measured continuously throughout the ship. So here's zero to, well, 600 seconds is 10 minutes here. So you drop it into the seafloor. Each of the thermistors rises to the temperature in the subsurface. So you get a temperature gradient. Then you fire a heat pulse. And then the rate at which these decay give you in situ thermal conductivity away from the probe. So that's brilliant. Here's thermal conductivity versus depth. Average conductivity about 1.1, probably sandy layers here for higher conductivity. And then you combine these measurements and these measurements in a, what we call a Bullard plot. And the slope of that is the heat flow. So here's a heat flow of 345 milliwatts per square meter. This is age about 4 million years seafloor. Remember the formula? <clears throat> 500 over the square root of time, right? So 500 over the square root of four is 250. So that's the high heat flow in this young seafloor. So you, you're in and out in about 12 minutes, you move to the next place. So I want to show you the consequence of, of many of these. So here's one place, this is a cruise that I was involved in, out on the Juan de Fuca Ridge in, uh, between Washington State and British Columbia and, and the ridge. So the, the bottom panel is the seismic section on the seafloor. So you have sediments here, and then the basaltic seafloor 
is here with a seamount emerging through the sediments. A tenth of a second is about 80 meters of sediment. So we have anywhere from 100 to 200 meters of sediment with a vertical exaggeration. Notice this is a few hundred meters and this is 25 kilometers. But if we make measurements here, these are two days of measurements. So here's 17 measurements, one day, 15 or so measurements the next day. The black dots are the actual measurements. The circles are corrections for sedimentation. They're essentially the same thing. And notice they're about 200 to 300 milliwatts per square meter, which is what you'd expect for this age of, of seafloor. So in spite of having maybe fluids coming out in the seamounts here and here, we're getting this, this is the expected value for this age of, of seafloor. So we get it because we have enough, uh, we have enough sediment. This, you can't see this point, but there's a point right there. It's the, what I call the no guts, no glory point, because what you've got is three kilometers of cable with a probe at the bottom of it. So if this were the ship, the probe would be down on Main Street. And you're dangling this and you want to get as close as possible to the seamount, but if you drop it on the seamount, you probably destroy the instrument. So you get as close as possible. And in fact, we got a point at about two watts per square meter up here. So this raised our, our attention to seamounts being areas where we have hot fluids coming out. So the question is, globally, what does this mean for fluid flux? So Jeffrey Wessel was in the process of publishing this map of seamounts. There are 15,000 dots on this map. So a lot of seamounts. And Rob Harris actually did this calculation of saying, if we have fluid circulating in the seamounts <coughs> of the, this dimension, 15,000 seamounts, then the mass flux is this. And we assume reasonable statistics. So for one seamount, we have nearly 10 to the 10th kilograms per year. And for all seamounts, we have 10 to the 14th kilograms per year. So there are 10 to the 12th kilograms per cubic kilometer, right? So this means you have 100 cubic kilometers per year of fluid flux through seamounts. So if you put that together with fluid fluxes elsewhere, <clears throat> what we've got is the ridge flank that we saw before, 15,000, seamounts about 100, and smokers on the ridge are very impressive, but smaller in volume. So these are substantial fluid fluxes. Uh, they're a small part of what we call the hydrologic cycle up here, which is rain, snow, and and land up here, but substantial in their own right. Now, I, I had an interesting, <laughs> interesting uh, idea when I did this. 400,000 cubic kilometers a year doesn't mean anything to me. So what I thought I needed to know was what's the average rainfall in a year? What's the average rainfall in a year? And nowadays you take out your iPhone, you'd say, hey Siri, What's the average rainfall in a year in the 1980s? Siri was born in 1915, I think, and Wikipedia didn't start until about 2000, or not 19, but 2015, early 2000. So I did the next best thing. I found a tame hydrologist and I said, hey, Kip, what's the average <laughs> rainfall in a year? So I have here what I call the Kip Solomon number. <laughs> So the average rainfall in a year is one meter. Right, Kip? Still one meter. Well, a thousand millimeters. A thousand millimeters <laughs> is approximately one meter, right? <laughs> so I, don't, I didn't trust a hydrologist entirely, so I said, let me check it out. So it's the volume flux over the surface area of the Earth. So spread that volume of water over the surface area of the Earth. And in fact, it works out. Here's the volume flux, four pi r squared for the Earth. And what you get is one meter. In fact, the most recent thing I, I saw for this number is it's up to about 520 cubic thousand cubic kilometers a year. 
And this comes out to 99 centimeters or one meter per year. So where does the water come from? Which is a nice next little calculation. And I think Kip remembered tell us that is you're basically evaporating seawater with solar power. Well, how does that work? So I thought, okay, let me take the solar power per unit area. And you start with the solar power at the outer, the outer part of the atmosphere, 1360 watts per square meter. That's what we call the solar constant. It's not really a constant, it's close to a constant. You reduce it by 30% for uh, reflection at the atmosphere, reduce it by another 20% for surface warming. You take it a half because of night and day. Then you have two obliquity factors, one for the fact that you want the normal component so th throughout the day. And the other obliquity factor has to do with latitude. And it turns out that the annual solar energy on the oceans is five times 10 to the nine joules per square meter. You evaporate water, so what you need is the heat of evaporation, which is 2.4 times 10 to the six joules per kilogram, and put it all in and it comes out to two meters. So you have ample solar energy for evaporating a meter of seawater plus heating things at the Earth's surface. So all's right in the world and I'm quite happy with hydrologists. Now, you recognize this is the first lecture in Hydrology 101, right? that one meter is the, the average rainfall. I think there's more to hydrology than this number. And in fact, uh, Paul showed in your, your DLS about three, four weeks ago, that the really interesting thing is how this number changes in space and time and is partitioned into snow and recharge and so forth. So maybe the first 10 minutes of hydrology 101 would be, would be this slide. So we're just about finished with the, the oceans, but I was fascinated with this idea that once you get out here, there's still a suspicion that you could get enough heat that's prompting cellular convection in the oceanic crust. And to the right of this slide, this all goes away because the heat poops out and you don't have the heat to drive convection and you probably have this cementation of oceanic sediments, so the permeability drops. But could we see cellular convection in Earth's crust? To my knowledge, it, it had never been physically observed. So we had a region out on the Juan de Fuca Ridge where we had very flat basement and a lot of sediment. So we spent three days hunting for cellular convection. So here's the sea floor five kilometers, there's a 10th of a second two-way travel time, that's 80 meters, we have about 160 meters of sediment, and as far as we could see, dead flat basaltic basement of the pillow basalts. So we spent three days making measurements. So here's the first day, we stopped here, the next day we came back, that's the reproducibility, there's the second day, and there's the third day. And we think, or thought at the time, we quite possibly seen convection cells in the, in the uh, pillow basalts, right? So, uh, but we didn't really know. Well, I showed this slide at another meeting in France. It was in Bordeaux, France on sedimentary basins. And there was a very interesting group because Bordeaux is, has an institute for convective studies in porous media. It was headed up at the time uh, by Michel Carbonos, who is a cigar smoking, wine drinking, charismatic director of the institute. And so there was a, a session in the afternoon on convection in permeable aquifers, sandstone aquifers in sedimentary basins. And if you had convection, would that change the thermal regime? And would that change uh, the maturation of hydrocarbons over time? So I showed this slide and I said, I, I really don't know if this convection, but if it is, then it's possible to have a convection in porous media. 
So that night in a bar, uh, I was sitting next to Kambarnos, and he said to me, David, he said, it's a very interesting slide that you've shown us today. He said, I think we can help you. <laughs> so he had me sketch out what I thought was going on. And what I thought was going on is this Heaplow probe, probe that, we, that we had seen. And I thought that we had sediment, we knew the conductivity over basalt, we knew that conductivity. We knew the heat flow, but we didn't know it was this thickness and whether we had convection or not. So about a week later, they sent me the diagram that's on the upper right over here. So this is a convection stability diagram. It's the Rayleigh number, which is the number, the, the measure is a dimensionless number. A high number promotes convection, a low number uh, is against convection <clears throat> versus the size of the convection cell. So this is the height over the, of the, the width of convection cell. So what it says is that <clears throat> if, if you have, so if H is very small, so these are horizontal sausages, it's much harder to get convection. You get convection by being above the line. If you have very cylindrical where cells where H is very tall, then it's also very hard. But there's a region here where the cells are more equidimensional, which is easiest to get convection. And in this diagram, you get it for this parameter equal to 1.9. And you can get convection if you can get the Rayleigh number above 43. You can plug in these numbers to our wavelength here, and you get that we predict that the aquifer would be 360 meters thick. And in the, in the number for, for the Rayleigh number, everything here in the numerator promotes convection. In the denominator works against convection. And the only uncertainty here is permeability. So you can back out a predictability, predicted permeability of seven times 10 to the minus 14. Kip, remember these two numbers, 360 meters for the thickness and seven times 10 to the minus 14. Now, fortunately, we can check these because the ocean drilling program actually drills and then use Packer tests to measure the permeability in situ. So here's the, here's the measurements for the permeability structure of the oceanic crust. So this is permeability. These units are, are uh, meters squared. So this is, and this is depth in the igneous crust down to one kilometer here. So what you see is that there is a permeable part. This is the permeable uh, pillow basalts. And then when you get down below that, then it's impermeable, relatively impermeable. And the thickness of this layer, Kip? Looks pretty good. 360 meters, which looks pretty good. And the permeability is between 10 to the minus 13 and 10 to the minus 14. Bingo. So I think we nailed it. I think we have imaged hydrothermal circulation in the ocean crust. <clears throat> So what have we learned about all these investigations on the seafloor? To get real heat flow, you've got to stay away from seamounts and you've got to get into a region that is, has a lot of sediment. So we have filtered <coughs> the oceanic heat flow by those two things. So Derek Hastrock, who was a student here, did this filtering. So he said, let's stay 60 kilometers away from a seamount and let's only take measurements with 400 meters of sediment. And when you do that, you get this beautiful agreement now of heat flow versus, so remember I introduced this by saying, if you don't get the answer that you're looking for, maybe something more interesting is going on. That's certainly true. But now we show that when you use what you've learned to filter the data, then you get good agreement, which is the third spoke in that heat flow, bathymetry and lithospheric thickness. So Clyde Lister, who unfortunately died, uh, if he had heard me subsequently, he would have come up and said, nice, nice paper, Chapman. I'm glad you finally got it correct. 
So I, I take my hat off to Clyde. Escape. Pardon? Okay, thank you. So let me finish on the, the last topic here, which is <clears throat> the energetics. The, the title is Energetics of the Earth. And it takes its title from a beautiful little book that John Verhugan at Berkeley produced in uh, 1980, in which he asks We have these various processes that go on in the Earth. So earthquakes, volcanoes, rock metamorphism, mountain building, heat flow, et cetera. What, what is the power in watts that's continually being released by these energy sources? And then I've added to that human energy and solar energy. So I'm gonna run through these and make calculations. They're very simple. Just remind you that <clears throat> energy is measured in joules. Power is energy over time in watts. So a watt is a joule per second. These are very simple things for mechanical energy, heat energy. So the rules are, we will calculate energy for each of these in watts. Uh, we'll only use powers of 10, and most importantly, no quibbling, okay? No quibbling from the audience. <clears throat> so well, let's run through them. So the first one on the left is earthquake energy. So we take our model of elastic rebound where strain energy is built into a fault zone, the earthquake ruptures, giving this afterwards, and we have this seismic energy is distributed around the world. Seismologists have given us <clears throat> an equation that relates energy to the magnitude of the earthquake. So I'll illustrate that for a magnitude eight, because by and large, we get one magnitude eight per year. So if you put this number Magnitude eight, you get 10 to the 16 joules divided by three times 10 to the seven seconds in a year, and you get about 10 to the nine watts. If you double that for breaking rock, heat, various other things that could be going on, <clears throat> you get a, a little bigger number, but that's just for a magnitude eight. But then we use a rule of thumb that says for every one in magnitude that you decrease, you get 10 times more earthquakes. So for one magnitude eight a year, you get 10 magnitude sevens a year, but the energy goes down by a factor of 30, according to this formula. So if you had 10 times more, but one thirtieth of the energy, then you basically have one third of the power. So magnitude sevens are one third, magnitude sixes are one ninth, magnitude fives are one twenty seventh. So you soon find out that most of the energy is in big earthquakes. So if you sum from magnitude nine <clears throat> down to small earthquakes, you get about 0 0.02 terawatts. So that's our first number. If you go to volcanoes, vol this should say volcano power. Volcanoes uh, release energy in two ways. They blast stuff into the air and then they bring magma to the surface. So if you blast it into the air, the energy is MGH. That's the potential energy of the ash cloud. <clears throat> you divide it by time. So what you need to know is the mass per unit time that goes up into the clouds. So volcanologists are very helpful. They produce tables of this. Every year, you know, how many volcanoes, how much mass in the cloud and so forth. If you put those together, you get 0 0.02 terawatts, about the same thing for earthquakes. But volcanoes also bring magma to the surface along a mid-ocean ridge. <clears throat> and large igneous provinces. So you have the mass, specific time, specific heat, delta T, put those numbers in, and it turns out to be 0.2 terawatts. So 10 times more than earthquake energy. Metamorphism. So I think John Bowman or, 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 uh, or Bill Perry gave me the number that to drive a metamorphic reaction, a geophysicist metamorphic reaction, right? It doesn't depend on rock type or anything else. It's just a metamorphic reaction. It takes 50 calories per gram or 0.2 uh, megajoules per kilogram. So the question is how much rock is being metamorphosed each year? 
So there are two factories, types of factories of metamorphic rocks. One is accretionary prisms, but all you need to know is how much sediment are you pushing into the accretionary prism in a year? And you know that from the depth of sediment, the velocity at which is coming in and the length, total length of sedimentary prisms in subduction zones. So that turns out to be five times 10 to the ninth watts. The other metamorphic factory is in continental collision areas where you're pushing crust down into the lower crust and metamorphosing it. So once again, you just need the heat of metamorphism and how many kilograms per year are you pushing into these factories? And the big ones are the Himalayas, 10 to the 10 watts. The Alps are lesser because of the area. They're younger, but they're lesser. So this is again about 0 0.2, 0 0.02 terawatts. Mountain building is a little more difficult because what you're doing is raising land up to through a height H. So the power is now mg h over t, which is the uplift rate for a mountain range. <clears throat> and again, putting in typical numbers, uh, we get 0.4 terawatts. So we're proceeding quite nicely. Meteors were once really big, but no longer, they're like a mosquito now. They just don't, don't hit it. But meteor bolide scientists uh, have made graphs like this. So this is the time between impacts. Once again, we need, we have the meteorites coming in at one half MV squared energy, kinetic energy, and <clears throat> giving it up on, on a collision. So we get these graphs of the size of a meteorite versus the time between impacts. So down here at 10 to the minus three meters, <clears throat> so this is millimeter, uh, they come in every 30 seconds, but the really big ones come in every 10 million years. And it turns out that when you do the calculation, you're way down in the noise of 10 to the minus terawatts. And then finally, this on the right-hand side is the only one of these energy fluxes that we actually measure, because we measure heat flow. And if you measure heat flow in the oceans and then the continents and just integrate up you get 44 terawatts. So we can put all of these into a table. So here's the poor meteorites at the bottom going up and heat flow at the top. So what, what do you read into this table? It's basically that the earth is a heat engine. So heat is driving tectonics and tectonics is causing earthquakes metamorphism, volcanism, and so forth. So heat is the driver here. So I want to put two more numbers in this table. The first has to do with human energy. <clears throat> so we know it's going to be a big number because they're getting close to be uh, 8 million people on the surface of the earth. If you do a calculation for those of us that eat 2000 food calories a day to keep us alive, convert that into heat calories and convert it into joules and divide by the number of seconds in a year, what you get is that that feeding us this amount makes us each a hundred watt generator. So each of us is generating a hundred watts. That's why if you're in an elevator with a bunch of people and there's not air circulating, it gets hot pretty quickly. So a hundred watts times 10 to the eight, 10 to the ninth is, you know, close to a terawatt already, just to keep us alive. We haven't built a, a society. We, haven't, we don't have cars, we don't have lights, we don't have heating, et cetera. But if you do that survey for either production or consumption of energy, they both point to 15 terawatts. So a lot of energy in terms of humans. And then finally, solar energy, the sun is 10 to the 26 watts, it's a big nuclear, reactor, by the time it gets out to one Earth distance, the flux is 1,000 watts per square meter. If you intercept that with a disk the size of the Earth, it turns out that the Earth is accepting 170,000 terawatts. That's the rate at which we're accepting solar energy. So if you put that back in the table, 
what you get is, I think, a really nice perspective. So we previously had heat flow driving tectonics and the Earth just basically being a heat engine. Now we see that humans are exceeding the natural energy fluxes by things like earthquakes, volcanoes, and so forth. So the word Anthropocene, so the age of humans, was coined because humans are changing the Earth's surface. We're changing the temperature. We're changing the ocean acidity. We're changing the atmospheric chemistry. We, as humans, now move more rock per year than uh, nature erodes. So that's all reasons for calling this the Anthropocene. And I'm advancing another reason, namely that we now consume more energy than Earth's natural energy processes. And then finally, the solar energy. So if you look at that number, there's more solar energy landing on the Earth in an hour than we use in a year. I'm confident and optimistic that we'll learn to use this diffuse energy in a positive way. And I look back on, on the Chapman House on the East Bench here in 2015, we put on, on, a, on our garage, we put on solar panels and it produced 100% of our, our electricity for the entire year from these solar panels on the garage roof. Barb Nash visited me last week in her new electric car. She lives in Bellingham now and was very proud that she has solar panels on her apartment that produce enough energy to power her house, but plus her solar car, so her electric vehicle. So this is 100% uh, renewable energy. And then I read in the newspaper yesterday, I think, that to counteract the Russian embargo on oil and gas for Europe, the European Union now produces 24% of their energy from solar and wind. The number was probably 2% in five or 10 years ago, and it's now 24%. So I'm, I'm confident that we will learn how to do this. <clears throat> so let me finish uh, the, the talk with a, with a quick summary. We've covered a lot of ground, right? We started with the mid-ocean ridges and heat flow bathymetry and lithosphere boundary. We uh, explored the deficit of heat flow in young seafloor and the statement that Turi is fond of using of, if you don't get the answer you're looking for, maybe something more interesting is going on. And looked at water circulation through the ocean of crust. We saw that black, black smokers are basically small power plants, seamount venting, and uh, imaging cellular convection in the oceanic crust. And in an energetics of the earth, we went on to show that we're in a time of Anthropocene and that solar energy is, is for the future. So I thought I'd, I'd just finish up with showing you a picture of what a thermal geophysicist, how a thermal geophysicist does, does field work. <laughs> so if, if I were a Bartley or a Bowman, then I'd be out pounding on rocks. But instead, I'm sitting in a, in a chair measuring temperatures in a 200 meter borehole waiting for the probe to equilibrate every meter as I go down, which gives me ample time to both think about what I'm doing, but think about problems in geophysics and thermal geophysics that you can solve on the back of an envelope. Thank you.